Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. So glad to be with you all on this beautiful Sunday morning. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving and safe travels, and it's great to have you back and to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. 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 Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Well, one uh, major announcement is we're having the hanging of the greens today after service. So um, anybody who's available to stick around and help us to decorate for the Christmas season, we're going to be putting up the Christmas tree in the fellowship hall, the nativity scene outside, and decorating the sanctuary um, for the Advent season. As much as we can get done today, if it bleeds over into tomorrow or the next day, that's fine because there's a lot of work to do, um, but uh, many hands make for light work in a case like this. Now let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to be in worship uh, with one another today as your children, as fellow believers, as a church congregation. God, we thank you for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us as your children. God, we ask that you will help us to leave any care, uh, any worries, any anxiety, any angst, uh, help us to leave it at the door, God, so that we can be totally present here in this space at this time uh, to put our full attention into worshiping you, God, and to lifting up your holy name. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'll turn it over to Seal for our call to worship. Uh, at this time, we've got the lighting of our first Advent candle of the season. This is, uh, as you see, it says lighting of the candles, the Leek and Lucignolo families. That is my family as well as my parents. I reminded them Thanksgiving Day, don't forget we have the lighting of the Advent candles. And they said, oh, we forgot to mention we're taking a flight to Cancun tomorrow. <laughs> like, really? So I'm sure they found a church down there where they're worshiping this morning. So instead, I will invite uh, my wife and children forward, and we will light the first candle of the season. If you hold this, please, Dagny. Slip behind you. It's okay. You can do the first one. I think so. Put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. Blessed is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the Lord, who remains faithful forever. And now we will light the candle of hope. And our Advent season has begun. Amen. Amen. Thank you, beautiful family. Please stand and join us in our first hymn as you're able, O Hall of Jesus, 170.
Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I will call Miss Amy forward, as well as the children in the congregation to come forward for this morning's children's moment. Uh, after the children's moment, the kids will be invited to go to the children's building for Children's Church. There you are, Miss Amy. Am I on? Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I know that you all have, a, have an awesome activity plan for over there. At this time, we're going to get into our pastoral prayer, a uh, prayer that, we'll off, that um, I will offer up on behalf of the congregation. Now, something I'm going to do a little bit different this morning. You know, I always begin with a reading from, from a psalm, which I will do, and then I will go into a, a prayer that I wrote in my office yesterday. I find that it's helpful to, to write out prayers from time to time because it helps train your mind and what exactly you are asking God for, what you're thanking him for. It helps you put your words together so that when you go to God in prayer, you, it, it's easy to speak to him. So as I was writing this yesterday, um, I came across a few things, uh, a few opportunities where I would like to take a moment of silence, and you'll be prompted for this in the prayer, when we will let the, the silence sort of hang for, for five to ten seconds. And you will be asked to lift up the names of those uh, for whom you are praying, either out loud or silently within your heart. However it is that you are being called to do so is perfectly fine. But you'll be prompted to do that during our prayer today. And we will close, as, a, as is our usual custom, with the Lord's Prayer. So at this time, let us go to God in prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, in you I trust. Do not let me put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let those be put to shame who are wantonly treacherous. Make me know your paths, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you, I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for your goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant 
and his decrees. O oh Lord, there are loved ones today for whom we pray, and prayers even now being whispered before the throne of your grace. We ask for your help without hesitation, knowing that you are disposed to give even before we ask. We thank you for our asking that has been received and prayers that have been answered. We are so glad that by your grace and mercy, broken bones have been mended, weak and struggling hearts have been made strong. We thank you that pain has been removed, the sick has so often been made well. Hear us now as we pray for some who need stronger hearts. You are the great doctor who can do it. Will you now strengthen the hearts of them whom we name even now? Stacy, my sister Teresa. God, we pray for some who are sick with COVID. And while human skill can do this and do that and say wait and rest, quarantine and isolate, we know that your skill alone can heal our physical bodies and infirmities. Please, God. Hear us now as we pray for this. God, we think of some whose eyes need to see in every sense of the phrase. We know that our Lord Jesus has certainly not forgotten how to do this. Hear us as we pray for these miracles today. And God, now grant us that spiritual perception and faith that having asked, reaches out to accept your good gifts. Help us to keep our eyes fixed upon you and not on the symptoms of our afflictions. And grant to us in your own time and in your own way a complete return to that health and strength which is your perfect will for your children. In your strength, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We pray the words of our great shepherd, Jesus Christ, as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Our New Testament reading is from 1 Thessalonians, verse 3, chapter 3, excuse me, verses 9 through 13. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts and holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. This is the word of the Lord for the people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. If you would stand as you're able for our gospel reading this morning, it is uh, brought to us from the book of Luke, chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you again for this opportunity to be in worship. And God, I thank you for the opportunity to bring your word. And I understand the responsibility that comes along with preaching your good word, God. I ask that you strengthen me when I'm weak. If I begin to stumble, then close my mouth. But Lord, hide me behind the cross so that all things will be to your glory and not my own. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. It tells us today not to be caught up in dissipation and drunkenness when the day of the coming of the Lord. Imagine being in any condition other than complete sobriety when Jesus returns. Imagine being in the state such that it is when we are in the hospital under the influence of pain medication, pain management medication. There's a reason that when we go in for procedures, we are encouraged not to make any legal decisions or any major life-altering decisions as the anesthesia begins to wear off. We're simply not in a condition at that time to think properly. As a pastor, I've had the opportunity many times to do hospital visits. That's a major part of my responsibilities. And um, I always um, take my obligation seriously to not repeat what I'm told in the hospital room. But uh, it 
would, it is unbelievable some of the things that people feel the need to confess to me when they are under the influence of pain medication. But I keep it to myself, I don't spread it. But it's very clear that you say things that you would not otherwise say. Your guard is let down a little bit. In the Advent season, we celebrate the most important event in the history of the world. The birth of Christ, God becoming flesh, and entering into our world. This is without a doubt the most well-known story in all of Western culture and is revered across many cultures and languages. Unfortunately, we share the event with many pagan symbols that have nothing to do with Christianity whatsoever. That's okay, though, if the symbology and cultural traditions aid in reminding us of this monumental event, then so may it be. It's worth noting, though, how sweet and innocent this part of Christ's story really is, and in turn, how receptive we are to the story. People are generally pretty receptive to a baby wrapped in blankets, lying in a manger, surrounded by magi and animals and such. Our celebrations are beautiful. I was speaking with someone recently, and I commented on how much I love a Methodist sanctuary at Christmas time. I may be biased, but it seems to me that nobody does a more beautiful job decorating the house of God in celebration of the coming of the Christ child. A solid Christmas Eve service, culminating in the dimmed lights and singing of Silent Night, touches a chord within me that is hard to put into words. This is indeed a beautiful time. The second coming of Christ is a completely different story and is more difficult to digest for several reasons. One, we haven't experienced it yet. The birth of Christ, his life, teachings, ministry, suffering, death, and resurrection were at one time very difficult to come to grips with. And even today, after 2,000 years, it is still almost unbelievable what God did for us and the events that took place. When I truly consider it, I am at a loss of words for the sorrow that I feel for having not given my every thought and action to thanking God every day. The second coming of Christ is yet to be, and the difference between the has occurred and the yet to occur is a great chasm. And what we are told is to be is terrifying. When Christ came into the world, God humbled himself to the point of becoming flesh and entering into our physical world. He was beaten, mocked, spat upon, and crucified. The next time he comes, he is not going to appear in the form of an innocent baby laying sweetly in a manger. The next time Christ comes, he is going to reconcile all things to himself, and it is not going to be pretty. Put yourself in God's place. Do you ever do this? I find it to be helpful in understanding the mind of God, but I also find it to be a reminder of how bad of a God I would be. <laughs> I don't have the temperament to be God. I would be zapping people that irritate me. I would be abusing my authority. I wouldn't last a half day as God. But when I put myself in the place of God, in his shoes, and try to understand the mind of God, it is beneficial in understanding how he may view us as his children in the light of the fact um, that he has given his only begotten son and how we live. You can imagine how God might view our daily activities in that light, that he sent his only begotten son into the world to be crucified. Now, I am not God. My son is not God. But I can imagine that even in our fallen state, if I were to offer up my own son for the sake of others, and then the others ignored this and continued to live lives saturated with sin and offering almost no repentance, I would be furious. The next time I showed up, the wrath I would pour out would be unlike anything the world had ever seen. The suffering I would subject the world to would be unimaginable. I would show mercy toward those who had made an earnest effort to live lives in reverence of my only son and in accordance to my will, and I would inflict unimaginable horror on everyone else. So then, we can imagine how God may view a similar situation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
And how do we repay him? What attitudes do we show toward others? What sort of grace and mercy do we bestow upon others? When someone wrongs us, do we extend grace and understanding that we too have wronged others? Or do we behave vindictively and actively seek an opportunity to exact revenge? Probably the latter. Therefore, we may be certain, simply from a rational, logical standpoint, that God is probably not going to be happy. But just in case we've missed this, we've been given plain instructions so as to what this will look like, what we may do to avoid the worst possible misery, and how we are to prepare for this event, which is certain to happen. First, Jesus tells us a brief parable of a fig tree, reminding us that we see a, free, a fig tree sprouting leaves and we know for ourselves that summer is near. This is an appeal to our intuition or our unspoken knowledge. For a people who have been around fig trees their entire lives, as his disciples were, they don't need to be told that when the leaves are, uh, that when the leaves are sprouting, it is a precursor to warmer weather. This is knowledge everyone knows without being taught. For our lesson today, this is the natural understanding of justice and how the natural world works. We don't need to really be taught that when a wrong is committed, something is going to have to take place to bring about the balance of justice. So Jesus tells us when we see these things taking place, we may know that the coming of Son of Man is near. Signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars distress among the nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and of the waves. Now, I've put an asterisk here, an asterisk, because I want to, on a side note, talk a little bit about biblical symbology here. The writers of Holy Scripture knew that they had to transfer knowledge across millennia. And they were deeply held truths and lessons that had to make it through on this journey. And it is a truth that any time somebody is in a position of power, any king or ruler or authority, they are going to review these stories and reject from the people anything that serves to subvert their power and authority. So many times the writers have to bury in scripture, within allegory, mythology, symbolism, some of the truths that have to be carried through across the generations. When we're studying the Bible, sometimes we have to look at this symbology in order to understand what's being told to us. That's why Jesus says, let those who have ears hear. Let those who have eyes, let them see. You have to dig into it to understand what they're saying. And in this situation today, when it says there will be, um, there will be uh, distress among the people and, uh, to paraphrase, uh, bewilderment at the sea and the waves. Now, in this sense, the symbolism of the sea and the waves is the population. You've heard it said you look across a great population and it's a sea of people. Many times in Scripture, when we're talking about oceans, the seas, the waves, it's talking about a population. When what we're told in the scripture today is that there will be great waves within this population, within this sea. There is going to be great conflict within our society, within our population. You can certainly imagine what that would look like. So is there any avoiding this? No. Is there anything we can do to prevent the horror of a God coming in the clouds to rapture his church and inflict punishment on the wicked? No. It is going to happen. It is an undeniable truth that God's divine justice will be carried out. The best we can hope for is to be on the right side of this divide and to be ready when it happens. Do we know when it's going to come? No. If we knew when the master would return, would return we would be waiting. I'm going to read an excerpt from Matthew 24, verses 45 through 51. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has put in charge of his household to give the other servants their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find at work when he arrives. Truly I tell you, 
he will put the one in charge of all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed, and he begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he does not know. He will cut him into pieces and put him with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Therefore, God is going to return at a time that we do not expect him. What are we to do then? Be prepared at all times, particularly being of sober mind and going about the building of God's kingdom. Surely, we should not dare to be found destroying God's kingdom when he arrives. Lord, I can imagine what it would be like. Our text today tells us not to be caught up in dissipation and drunkenness. What is dissipation? Debauchery, decadence, squandering of money, energy, resources, etc. So how then are we to live our lives? I want to offer an analogy, and this is one that I use sometimes uh, just as, a, as an image in my own mind to try to understand different philosophical and theological truths. I want us to pretend today that we are owners and operators of a zoo. This zoo has many different kinds of animals, and we are responsible for all of them. Within one part of the zoo is an enclosure with a bunch of chimpanzees. Now, we provide them with food, shelter, resources, but we do so in a manner where they do not see us and they are unaware where their food comes from because we provide it from a position that is out of sight. Now imagine within this enclosure that there are two chimps that we're observing. One chimp is stomping around the enclosure. He takes more than his share of food. He stores it in a place where only he can access it. He pushes the other chimps around. He continually takes the attitude that he is king of the chimpanzees. He runs the show and nothing happens in the habitat that doesn't first pass through him. Now there's a second chimpanzee. This chimp stays to himself for the most part and when he interacts with others, he does so in a respectful, humble manner. Each day, the chimp takes only the amount of food that he personally needs. He gives thanks for the food, and he gives the remainder of his food to those weaker than himself, who had their food taken by the other chimp. He lives a quiet life of simple gratitude and respect for the dignity of the others. Now, when the time comes for us to close the zoo, some of the chimps are going to be euthanized and some are going to be transported to the new habitat that is much greater than the current one. Which of these two chimps are you going to reward with a place in the new habitat? The answer is obvious. The chimp who lived a life of quiet and humility. In light of this example, it's easy to see how God expects us to live our own lives. God provides all that we have. And in fact, many times he provides more than we need. We are not perfect and we make mistakes. God understands this and pours out abundantly his divine grace and mercy. Yet we still have an obligation to put forth an earnest effort to live lives of quiet obedience, not to human authority, not to tyrants or bullies, but to God himself. If our lives of humility lead us to injustices, we will surely be awarded damages when the day of judgment comes. But in the meantime, let us remember that as sure as Christ came into the world, he is going to return. He came the first time as an innocent baby to suffer on our behalf and to redeem the lost. He will come again to rapture his church and to reconcile himself to those who believe in him and live lives according to his will. Let us always strive to live lives according to his will. Amen? Amen. Amen.
At this time, I would like to invite our ushers forward for this morning's offering. Lord God, we thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon us, God, for your grace, your love, your mercy. God, we ask this morning that as we offer our tithes and our offerings, God, that you will help us to be responsible stewards with these resources that belong to you and to your church. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. For our benediction this morning, we have a responsive reading. From where we are to where you need us. Jesus, now lead us. From the security of what we know to the adventure of what you will reveal. Jesus, now lead on. To refashion the fabric of this world until it resembles the shape of your kingdom. Jesus, now lead on. Because good things have been prepared for those who love God. Jesus, now lead on. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.